Good Thursday morning, everyone. Welcome into the morning medical update. Today is Veterans Day, November 11th, the day that we stop to honor those who have served and who are currently serving our country in the military. COVID, as we know, has impacted so many different groups hard and in so many different ways. Veterans are no different. A recent study found that the positivity rate for unvaccinated veterans stands at 25%. That number is high. Can that be changed? We're going to talk more about that. We'll also discuss whether COVID can cause PTSD in veterans. And we're gonna check in with these two right there and learn how they lean on each other for support. That is Matt and his buddy Archie. So we're gonna to talk to them here in just a few moments. So get your questions sent into us via Facebook, YouTube, and also you can email those to the Medical News Network. There's links right there on your screen. So get those in, but first, okay. Medical Director of Infection Prevention and Control, Dr. Dana Hawkinson joins us with numbers from overnight. How are we looking? Yeah, we're holding steady. Static. Um, still with 16 active infections, uh, six in the ICU and one on the ventilator. We have 21 additional patients meeting that recovery criteria. Uh, I would say though that we haven't had a death since the 7th, which is a very good thing. And Hayes has seven active infections and nine in that recovery period as well. But what I saw uh, today at the Kansas City Star is that the overall seven day average for the number of cases in the Kansas City metro area is starting to climb again, unfortunately. We hit a, uh, a nadir of just under 200 uh, about a week ago, 200 cases a day, but now we are starting to climb back up on that rolling seven day average. So that's concerning. All right, thank you for that. We may have questions, so let's get to any reporters on the line today. Okay, none on the line, so um, we want our community, of course, to get some of those questions coming in. We'll get to those here in just a few moments. We know that COVID, though, continues to affect people daily in some way or another. Veterans are a group that was hit hard in particular, and a new study shows that still many veterans are hesitant to get the vaccine. A study in the JAMA Network op uh, Open finds that 71% of veterans who used the VA had gotten one or both shots already, but 29% were still unvaccinated because they have fears of potential side effects or just the newness of the vaccine. So they still have many questions. So we want to turn to our guest today. Colonel Barry Browning is right here to my right. Uh, he is a senior administrator at adult psychiatry here at our health system. Uh, he is a veteran. Also a veteran is Dr. Nicole Yedlinski, a physician here at our health system as well. So welcome to you both, but most importantly, thank you for your service. Thank you. Thank so you. glad to have you here both on Veterans Day. We're gonna talk about a whole lot of good stuff and we want you to educate us and what we need to know about our veterans here in our community. But Dr. Yedlinski, you were a major in the U.S. Army. So you, you sent me some of these beautiful pictures. So tell us a little bit about what's going on in some of these, where are you? I wanna hear a little bit about your experience serving our country. Thank you so much. Uh, so this first picture, that was a while ago. I was out in the field. Uh, this was uh, mm -hmm. when I earned my expert field medical badge. Oh, this was, um, so I had twins when mm -hmm. I was serving in the Army. Uh, and my spouse and I were dual military. So as you can imagine, that brought some challenges. This was at my promotion to major. Uh, you can see baby in each arm there. Uh, <laughs> but this was a really proud moment. I mean, so, like full on have your hands full. That's oh, a tough for sure. Battlefield yeah. right there. Yeah, that so is this a battle, was, yeah. yeah, that was uh, a serving dual military down in <clears throat> Fort Polk, Louisiana, which is a, a pretty, pretty rural area. Uh, so mm -hmm. that was mm -hmm. that was a tough time. Yeah, this was this was early on. This was, I believe, at Fort Bragg, North Carolina, where I did my residency. Uh, my husband uh, was a UH-60 pilot, so a helicopter pilot in the Army. Um, and uh, yeah, brought it brought some challenges. Oh, fantastic. Thank you for sharing those. A very Army Medical Service Corps that yes. you were in, Deputy Chief of Staff of Medical Plans and Operations. You were in Iraq. Tell us a little bit about the photos we're seeing here. Well, actually that was in Iraq. That was my command photo um, at the time. Um, and then that was, a, a. I love this picture. That's this beautiful. This was July 4th, mm -hmm. 2010. Mm -hmm. That was standing on top of one of the bombed out palaces of Saddam Hussein. Wow. Wow. That was a fun day. <laughs> and then that was um, in southern Iraq. Um, very sandy, very desolate out there. Yeah. Thank you for sharing those. Sure. Um, what, is, what does Veterans Day mean? I, I always like to know from a veteran standpoint, what does Veterans Day mean to you as a veteran? Uh, to me, it's just 
takes me back to the memories, uh, being able to serve with for my country, but with also great people, people you know like Dr. Ulinsky, and um, I have friends all over the world now, yeah. and and I've met from all my deployments. It isn't just from the U.S. There are veterans from countries all over that we have served with, and even to this day, we stay in touch. Doctor, what's that camaraderie like? Yeah, I would agree. You know, it's that opportunity to pause and reflect on my own service and the service of all of the people I've met over the years, as well as, uh, like Barry said, from different countries all over. And you two worked together before, correct? We did. Correct. Mm -hmm. In civilian life. Well, in family medicine. In family yes. medicine. medicine. All right. And then we also work together with the Veteran Resource Group. And we're going to talk more about mm-hmm. that here in just a moment. And on that note, I want to bring in um, a couple other special guests this morning. Retired Marine Colonel Matt Bono, along with his dog, Archie. We want to thank both of you for your service. You're joining us from the Veteran Community Project. Um, so, Matt, good morning to you. So glad you're with us. Just please tell us more about this organization and what it's doing for veterans in our, in our community. Yeah, sure, absolutely. Thanks, Jessica, and, and uh, you're welcome. Come here, buddy. Sorry, Archie, get distracted a little bit. So, Veterans Community Project is a nonprofit based in Kansas City, but we're moving nationwide, and we're out to uh, end veteran homelessness uh, with the tiny houses that you see here in the village. Um, but we also help any veteran in need uh, through our outreach center uh, that is uh, at 8825 Troost Avenue. Uh, and we're having a big event there today. The, the VA's out giving shots. Uh, we've got all kinds of other veteran service organizations uh, on campus with us today. Uh, so if you're in the Kansas City area, come on out to 8825 Truce. Well, we're gonna, and we're going to put some information up on our screen and tell all of our viewers how they can help out. Okay, so we've got to get to Archie. He's been hanging out there this morning. So um, tell us about your friend and how uh, animals like Archie are helping veterans um, w- with what they're going through as far as you know, PTSD. Sure. I mean, who doesn't like a four-legged friend, right? They're loyal. <laughs> they're great companions. Archie's about 13 months old, so he's still got a bit of a pup in him. And you see him, he's tracking birds. He just loves to watch birds. So <laughs> he gets a little distracted, even though there's a camera here. But uh, the, animals are so soothing. Not, not just to vets, but to everybody, I think. Um, and one of the things that we do with our tiny houses, uh, we, we're a pet-friendly village. Uh, what you have is you have a lot of homeless vets that have animals, and they can't go to typical homeless shelters with those animals. Uh, and so dogs, cats, we've even had turtles here in the village, uh, mm-hmm. all very important to, to helping vets. And they live right there inside those tiny homes with the veterans, right? Absolutely, absolutely. Can we take a sneak peek inside one of those homes? I just think that is so fantastic. Yeah. yeah. Can you take us on a yeah, quick little tour? Come on, inside. Mm-hmm. Come on, Archie. Let's go, bud. So these are the tiny houses. We have uh, 49 tiny houses here at uh, Veterans Community Project here in Kansas City. We also have campuses in Longmont, Colorado, which we've started construction on, and a campus in St. Louis, which we're about to begin construction on. Uh, 49 tiny houses. uh, These are 240 square foot tiny houses. Uh, It's essentially like a studio apartment, but better. Uh, And what you see here is the way a tiny house is laid out when we move a veteran into it. Everything is brand new. They get their own pots, pans, dishes. Uh, They get their own linen, their own, uh, they always get a patriotic uh, handmade quilt. We have, uh, we have organizations that donate these these to us. Uh, Fully stocked bathroom. Uh, We stock a refrigerator, the freezer for their initial uh, move in. And um, I mean, it's, it's all you need. It's home. I love this. It's all you need. It is all you need. Absolutely. And, and, when, and, and when a veteran transitions out of here, they get to take all of this with them to their new place. So this is, this is transitional housing, uh, two years or less. Anytime a veteran moves in, they're, get, they're assigned a case manager, and uh, that case manager helps them uh, tackle their issues, basically. I, I tell people when I give them tours that people aren't homeless simply because they don't have a home. There's always something else going on in their life preventing them from from being housed. 
Matt, thank you so much for showing that. We're at stay, stay close because we want to come back to you. I'm going to let um, Archie go out and do some bird watching. And we're going to come back and talk to you in just a moment. And we're going to put some information up. Guys, in fact, for our viewers, if we can, can you go ahead and pull up the full screen so that people know um, about, I want to tell everyone about Vets with Pets. So this is an organization that is helping the Veterans Community Project and the needs are right there on your screen. So dog collars, leashes, um, dog and cat treats. Um, you heard they have all sorts of different animals there. So this is just, if you if you love animals um, and you want to help our veterans, this is such an, an amazing way to help with that. And of course you can drop off any type of, of items um, for these homeless veterans there at 8825 Troost. So we're going to put that back up on the screen again here and just a moment throughout the morning so that um, if you want to do something impactful for a veteran today, this is a great way to do it. Uh, Barry, I want to talk with you um, just about veterans with PTSD. Uh, is it diff, diff, does it differ or was it similar with non-military people with PTSD? I mean, talk about that. And then I want to bring the COVID aspect into it and try to make some comparisons if that's fair sure, to do. Sure. Yeah, I mean, veterans with PTSD and, and non-veterans with PTSD, they're really similar. The only thing that's really different is just the trigger that caused the PSD. Um, you know, there can be uh, sleeplessness, um, isolation, um, anger. There can be a lot of things that affect civilians. I'll use civilians and, and veterans, uh, which all it, it ends up affecting their family, their work, and all those kind of things. So it, it really is just the same. Well, I think PTSD is a term that we we immediately think of, when we think of veterans, right. we think of that. But now it's a term that we use to describe many um, catastrophic events in I someone's mean, life. frontline workers. Yes. I mean, all the things that we've gone through over the last almost two years, it seems like now, or getting close to it, affects everybody. So is it fair uh, to make that comparison? I think so. You do. Okay. So Dr. Yelinski, tell me what you're hearing from veterans and how, um, how COVID, how this pandemic has affected um, veterans that, that you know and that you've talked to, patients? You know, I think at the end of the day, uh, veterans with PTSD, uh, PTSD already is a, an isolating experience. Um, and as a result of the COVID pandemic, some veterans may feel even more isolated and have more difficulties with reaching out to get help and assistance for their PTSD. Well, you said an important thing as a physician, you said it's important for people I think people or physicians, regular people like us, it's okay to ask somebody if they've served, mm -hmm. um, what that was like for them. It's okay to ask about that. To, can it help us understand what you mean by that? Yeah, I think at the end of the day, most veterans um, welcome being asked the question, have you or a family member served in the military? And then that follow on question of what was that experience like? Tell me what it was like. I think for many years, uh, veterans weren't asked that question, especially our Vietnam veterans. Uh, and then also, you know, sometimes veterans get put up on a pedestal and we want to come down and to say, yeah, let, let's talk about our experiences. Let's talk about what that was like. I'm glad you say that because you're right. I think your Veterans Day is a day that we all we all take that day to pause, but you're living it every day. This is every day of the year for, for folks and, and the memories that they have. And it's okay to ask and talk about it anytime and have a better understanding about what you've gone through. Yeah, absolutely. Take, come down off the pedestal. Well, and some will. of the treatments for PTSD is actually getting into the experiences. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of different ways to treat PTSD, but one of the biggest ways is making the person that's suffering PTSD relive the experiences, work through the experiences. Because if as long as you just ignore it or, you know, encapsulate it and never doesn't doesn't exist, you never you never get past it. Sure. How have veterans fared during this pandemic? I mean just what you hear among your peers here at the health system, what, what do you hear? Well, and, and I have a, a little bit of a different perspective. Yes, I work here, but I get all my health care through the VA. Mm -hmm. And so at the very beginning of the pandemic, it was really interesting that nothing was set up, just like here. You know, we were all of a sudden trying to jump through and do telemedicine and all these things. Well, the VA, uh, it, it took a while to get that all spun up. And so really everything just ground to a halt. If you had procedures you need to have done, or if you needed therapy, or any of those kind of things, it stopped until the ball could get rolling again, which took, you know, six to eight months or longer to really get that. And so 
anyone that was suffering from PTSD, they were missing out on their therapy, mm-hmm. which was really key. Not, not good. And so, um, yeah, just another one of those groups that is affected and, right. and needs that, that medical help. So let's talk about the vaccine and hesitancy. I mean, the hesitancy comes in all forms, in all different groups. But w- what are your thoughts about the numbers we're seeing and maybe the questions they have? What, what makes that group unique as far as getting vaccinated? Sure. You know, I think for, I think for veterans, they've spent so many years in the military having a lack of choice and a lack of control. And I know most veterans have had so many vaccinations associated just with their military service. And then it becomes, well, I don't want to get one more vaccine or I don't want to be told I have to get another vaccine. And also there can be a mistrust of the medical system. Again, getting back to that lack of choice and lack of control associated with military service. And two, there's a lot of misinformation out there, especially about the vaccine. And at the end of the day, some people believe that the risks of the vaccine outweigh the benefits. And I think for me as a healthcare professional, I want to uh, reassure our veterans that the benefits of the vaccine outweigh the risks. We also see veterans who have uh, medical issues associated with their military service, whether that's uh, lung disease associated with burn pit exposure or um, uh, uh, cancers associated with depleted uranium exposure or Agent Orange causing diabetes. And that population's at increased risk for complications from COVID. And I want them to know that, again, the benefits of the vaccine outweigh the risks. Okay, so we want to get back there to Archie. He's sitting so still and being so good for us, <laughs> Matt. Um, we want to head back out to you. I want to ask you a couple more questions, um, just specifically about pets there um, in the tiny homes. Uh, you said that the pets are allowed to stay stay with the veterans inside. Are, do you also help other veterans that aren't living there? Are they allowed to bring pets to your organization to receive help? Well, yeah, we. Uh, you mentioned the outreach center. You mentioned uh, leashes and your list that you put up on the screen there. So I- any veteran uh, can come to the outreach center and get help. If they have pets, we have pet food. Uh, Archie's kind of done with being on the bed here, I think. But uh, we have pet food, uh, leashes, collars, toys, dog beds, uh, uh, things like that. So they can come and get any types of services like that. Sorry, he's, he's 13 months old. He needs more attention than he than he gets sometime. Um, we also provide for, uh, for, the, for the residents in the village, uh, we also have people that come out and uh, do uh, dog training uh, mm-hmm. on the weekends generally. So, uh, and we have organizations that come and do uh, wellness checks on the pets. Uh, our our uh, community center, uh, which is available for residents only, uh, we have a dog wash area in there. Um, so. That's yeah, a great. That's great that you pet, offer those services. Pets, How, pets are key. Thanks. So, uh, Matt, then just you mentioned it a bit earlier, but just for folks who are, are joining us, just how important though are these pets to veterans? I mean, there's there. I know there's just a special bond, but help us understand that bond a little bit more and how important they are. Sure. I mean, you know, have you ever been let down by your pet? I mean, that's, that's the basic question. I mean, there you go. So they're, they're loyal, they're faithful. Uh, they try to drink out of the toilet sometimes, but uh, it, they're still your pets. And, uh, you know, the, a lot of people, a lot of people that you see that are struggling, it's it, maybe it's because they've been let down by other people uh, or, you know, they've had some behavior that has caused that to happen. But, you know, generally with the pets, they're with you. I mean, they're with you for, for life. Uh, when you adopt a pet, I mean, it's, it's like having a child. So, uh, it, you know, I, I got Archie as a companion. I got him almost a year ago, and uh, I just wanted somebody that I could take with me wherever I went. Uh, he goes almost everywhere I go. He's not a service animal, so he doesn't get to go to the grocery store and a few other places, but um, he, he's just a great companion, somebody, he- something to have with me all the time. Yeah, he's spoiled. I can tell. Um, all right, tell him he's got to come no. out. Of, out of, <laughs> no, tell him he's got to get his head out of the toilet here in a minute because I want to see him again. Um, so while I have yeah. you here, though, Archie. Matt, I <laughs> I want you to tell me what you want our community to know about what you all need. What are your needs? Today is Veterans Day, and I know people are looking for an opportunity to help um, and to do their part. 
and to take that pause and um, and show their appreciation. So what other needs? We know their pet pet needs, but what about our veterans? What what can we do? Um, what could somebody drop off today or over the weekend? Sure. Sure. Well, we're looking, uh, it's the time of the year that we're looking for a nice warm winter clothing, uh, uh, boots especially, uh, like insulated coveralls, warm jackets, uh, you know, stocking caps, gloves, that type of thing. Uh, matter of fact, we're handing a lot of that stuff out today at, uh, at our stand down event uh, up at the uh, outreach center. Hey, buddy. Sorry, I'm making Cliff work here. <laughs> I know. Me That's all right. That's all right. He's happy to be out there. We love dogs. Okay, so hang tight. Let Archie run around, and we'll we'll touch base with you here in just a few moments. Okay, Matt, thank you so much. So I want to ask you, you Barry, about uh, the Veterans Resource Group through, through the health system. Tell us a little bit about that. Yeah, the Veterans Resource Group really is designed and, and comprised of uh, any employee of the health system that identifies with the military or being a veteran. We have close to over 500 members mm -hmm. that have identified. We have reservists, National Guard, that are active and that are still deploying, and then mm -hmm. veterans such as myself and Dr. Yulinski. Do we, are there enough of these programs in our community? You know, I think it's, if maybe if you're not a veteran, you don't know a veteran, you didn't grow up around veterans, you maybe think it's a group that's just being taken care of. But I'm glad we're talking about this today because we can find out our, what are the needs? Are there, are there enough resources for our veterans in our community and beyond? Where's the, where's the hole that needs to be filled? I, as a veteran, I think Dr. Yulinski would say the same thing. We're biased. I, I, but with my experiences, I think we need more services. There, um, veteran homelessness, which we've been talking about, is huge, you know, and it's not just men, it's, it's women also. Mm -hmm. And so there's a, a, a segment of the population that just gets forgotten. Mm -hmm. And so with the, the VRG, some of the things that we do, like we support the um, Veterans Community Project. We help, we help set up and supply their um, on-site medical clinic. And we do things here inside this, um, the hospital. If a patient comes in and they've identified as being part of the military, we're there to assist the families and the veteran, no matter what, what they need. And we go up, we, we meet with them on the floor, in their rooms, talk with them, talk with the family, find out what their needs, if they have questions. You know, sometimes it's just sitting with them because mm -hmm. they don't have any family and it's just being there with them. And, uh, and sometimes, you know, their final trip out of here after, you know, they've gone, we, we give them a dignified um, walk out of the hospital. And so it, we do a lot of things. What yeah. could you add to that? I would say uh, there are lots of organizations out there. What I think is most important is to make those links. Mm -hmm. So that's why it's so important to ask that question about military service so that we can identify our veterans and then uh, make those connections, whether it's homelessness or uh, whatever services they might need, whether they need to know about the services that are available through the VA, whether they need to know about any of the veteran service organizations uh, like VFW or American Legion, all of those organizations, uh, more often it's, it's, it's making those connections. So you're saying don't miss an opportunity if you have a chance to be in front of somebody, certainly a healthcare provider setting here and any other spot here in, in our community, but anybody to be asking and to making sure that you're getting folks sent in the right direction. 100%. And that's the, the thing that the VRG does. Mm -hmm. We get calls in all the time and you know asking for different things or you know where how do we you know we had a, a veteran that had been hurt actually on an active duty was in the rehab had lost the use of his legs his family was like what do we, what do we do how do we you know our house is even set up for this mm -hmm. and so we were able to get in touch with the different organizations in his community to get ramps built to get things done and it's because there's I'm an administrator. We have physicians, we have x-ray technicians, we have nursing, we have IT. We have a lot of people within the system with a lot of knowledge and we're able to come together and, and get the things that we need for these veterans. So Dr. Yedlinski, I'm gonna pull up a picture and I want you to help talk me through it a little bit if you would because your husband came back from his second uh, tour 
Can you tell me a little bit about when you see this picture, what does that uh, tell you and bring up? So this was um, my husband's return from his second deployment. Uh, this was a rough time. He had a lot of uh, traumatic experiences during that deployment. And uh, that was sort of the beginning of our journey with PTSD. I echo Colonel Bono's um, how pets can be a wonderful therapy, as well as uh, the services that my husband was able to access through both the military medical system as well as through the VA uh, to help get him through that very difficult time. Because I see that big smile on his face, but that doesn't tell the whole story is what you're telling no, me. No, I look at that picture and I see uh, he had lost a significant amount of weight um, and that was a direct result of his traumatic experiences and, and him dealing with those experiences. But he was able to access those resources. Do you guys have a, a dog in the house? We have two dogs. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> and trust me, they are an integral part of his uh, therapy for his PTSD, uh, that unconditional love and acceptance, uh, and just that calming influence that they have on him. We want to get to some community questions today for our guests. Isaac wants to know, has a question for our guest in your experience, and Matt, um, I'm going to come out to you here in just a moment and ask you this as well, but uh, Barry, you tell me a, a question about, um, in your experience, are a lot of veterans reluctant to seek treatment for PTSD because they think it is an admission of weakness? Uh, yes. I, I mean, there's always been a stigma um, with asking for help, and especially in the military. Mm -hmm. You know, you never want to see or show your weak. You want to you know, put the best face forward and that you're strong. And so asking for help, which if you have PTSD is, and going and getting help is, is one of those stigmas. And so it's, it's tough. It's tough. But Are we I getting think, better, though? I think we're getting better. I think we're getting better. I do. Um, you know, certainly also when you're still serving, uh, if you have a, a medical condition or a PTSD diagnosis, that can affect your job. That can affect your employment. And so at the end of the day, I think that also contributes to reluctance to get treatment and to get help. Matt, what are you hearing from your veteran friends there at the village? Yeah, I mean, I, I, even when I was active duty, uh, I mean, I agree with all the comments so far. Uh, seeking help was, was uh, a weakness. Um, so uh, I think we've gotten better at that. I hope we have. Uh, you know, we see veterans every day here in the village in an outreach center uh, that have experienced the same thing. Um, whether, it, whether they never fully got diagnosed, uh, went to get diagnosed, or whether they or whether it actually may have caused a discharge from the service uh, for uh, uh, severe PTSD. Dr. Hawkinson, I have a question for you. It's a media question from Donna at Channel 9. With an increase again in COVID cases, are the doctors worried we're heading in the wrong direction, especially as the weather cools mm -hmm. and gatherings increase? I know you and Dr. Seitz have yeah. talked about your concerns mm -hmm. about that. What can you add? Yeah, I mean, we certainly always have those concerns. And again, it's not just about the cases. Um, certainly we know cases are not the only uh, metric that we're using because we know some people may not go get tested. Some people may be testing at home and those things aren't recorded. Uh, but we do know and understand that uh, hospitalizations do lag behind the cases by a couple of weeks. And so that's really the concerning thing. If we do have uh, that increased number of cases, then we have to expect that those hospitalizations will follow. And that's really what we are trying to protect people from is going to the hospital, going to the ICU. And that's why the vaccinations are so important. It's not necessarily about the cases. It is about the hospitalizations, but we know we can use cases somewhat as a proxy for the impending hospitalizations that may come. So there is always that concern there, um, especially now as we are getting into colder weather, more people are gonna be inside doing more things. Um, probably lack of masking. So that's why it is so important for everybody who has not been vaccinated to go and start getting their vaccinations. Okay, question from uh, Jennifer. She says, I believe earlier this week in the news, there was an article that Pfizer had requested authorization for boosters to be available for anyone 18 mm -hmm. and older. Can you discuss that or do you have any new information about that? Yeah, um, nothing other than uh, we, you know, it will be safe. We're, we're pretty confident in that. Is it fully needed? We know that yeah, even people that got vaccinated in January or February of this year still have really, really good protection against hospitalization, especially those older, or sorry, those younger 
demographics, those people that are uh, younger than 65, we know you still have very good protection against that. Now, will getting that boost uh, or that additional dosing help reduce transmission for some sort of short period of time? That may be a possibility as well. And so we'll just wait and see really what the data tells us, what the data shows. You know, we have relied on some other countries' data as well as our own, especially we've gotten very good data from the VA systems as well. And so they've contributed a lot to that, uh, you know, has as um, Israel's experience as well. So we'll wait for that. Again, the safety is there. We know it will be safe. How much is it needed? There's also a concern that we shouldn't be getting these extra doses here in this country, but maybe giving them to other countries as well, those, uh, those countries that aren't as fortunate uh, to have the supply that we do. But those are, are, are different aspects, not necessarily medical aspects. Uh, but again, we'll wait for the data on, on the medicine and really understand, is it needed? Will it help reduce transmission? But again, we know if you've got your first two doses of those mRNA vaccines, even back in January, February, you are still very well protected against going to the hospital. Okay, a couple more questions for you, Dr. Hawkinson. Mm. Elizabeth says, I had COVID a month ago. I have a lot of headaches, dizziness, mm. and my vision is blurry. Mm -hmm. Is this normal? Yeah, this could be part of long COVID. And this is why we say, yeah, you may not go to the hospital. You may not die. You may not go to the ICU. But anytime you get this infection, you are rolling the dice with the complications that can occur. Uh, if you are vaccinated, we know we have good uh, evidence and data signals to show that you are at risk of getting these types of post-acute or post-infection symptoms is lower. And that is one of the benefits of vaccine as well. So it certainly could be part of the long COVID. Again, for our long COVID multidisciplinary clinic, we really need you to have had the acute infection uh, and then those symptoms for 12 weeks prior to getting in. But if those symptoms persist, hopefully they will go away and you'll get back to your normal daily routine. But if they persist, certainly we are willing to, uh, to see you and evaluate you for those symptoms and try to prov provide some of that support and, and help towards getting better. And Angela would like to know, how would I know if my child gets myocarditis? Mm -hmm. What are the signs? Yeah, and I'll have Dr. Yedlinski step in here as well. But I think for the most part, you're gonna really just be um, identifying with maybe some symptoms that that child may have, such as chest pain, maybe some shortness of breath. Those are really gonna be the main things, and I'll let Dr. Yedlinski okay. answer that too. Yeah, so some of the symptoms associated with myocarditis would be like what Dr. Hawkinson said, chest pain, sometimes you can experience a rapid heartbeat, sometimes patients might experience a little bit of shortness of breath or some uh, exercise intolerance. And we can see myocarditis, there were some cases in the adolescent male population after vaccination, um, as well as we know that there's a risk of myocarditis uh, after COVID infection itself. Yeah, and that's a great point. I would like to piggyback on that. You know, we still have some parents saying, well, why do I need to get my kids the vaccine if they are going to be at risk of myocarditis? But that risk of getting myocarditis is much greater if you get the infection compared to if you get the vaccine. In addition, we know that the median number of days in the hospital, if you have myocarditis from the infection itself, is six days, almost a week but we know that the median stay in the hospital if you get myocarditis from the vaccine is only a day. So, you know, you are certainly going to be in the hospital longer getting myocarditis from the infection itself as compared to the vaccine. And what we have seen is the vaccine induced um, complications really are very self-limiting and, and last just a short amount of time. Back to our veterans, Dr. Yelinski, what, what do you want them to know about COVID and the vaccine as we as we wrap up this morning? Just what's important, what's a good message you really want to send to them this morning? Again, getting back to that idea that there's so much misinformation out there, and I want our veterans to know that the benefits of getting vaccinated far outweigh the risks from the vaccine itself. And if you have questions, please reach out to a uh, reputable healthcare professional to answer those questions directly. What would you say to somebody who has some, some doubts or uh, some hesitancy? What message do you want them to hear from you directly? Well, I would say it, it as a veteran and having, you know, as we talked earlier, 
having multiple uh, vaccinations. I, I've had 14 anthrax shots mm. over my <laughs> career in the military. And so, you know, that was very interesting to say the least. But with the COVID vaccine, it's been tested. It's, it's trusted. We have the track record on it. As Dr. Hawkinson was saying, it, it's, it's better to do it and, and maybe have some milder effects if you do get um, COVID than to not have the vaccine and have very severe long-term uh, consequences of it. And so if I, you know, I would say, if I can do it after 14 anthrax shots, <laughs> anyone, anyone can, can do, do it. it. You could do it, yeah. yeah. It's the same message yeah. we say every day. Um, so thank you for reiterating that. Uh, quick question though, Emily wants to know, does the vaccine protection drop for teens after six months also, specifically 13 to 15? Do we hear anything about that? Yeah, I don't remember specifically off the top of my head. Um, I, I think we still have good protection uh, after that six month uh, time point for those adolescents as well. So uh, again, I think we have to, again, talk about what are we talking about with vaccine protection and effectiveness? Is it protecting against the infection itself, which the vaccine is really not made to do that, but it does provide that protection, especially in the short term. More uh, are we talking about protection against going to the hospital? Certainly it does continue to provide that protection um, even after that six month mark. Anything to add to that? I just wanna add, you know, we also have to look at uh, the risk uh, to other uh, individuals who may come mm -hmm. into contact with those adolescents, right? Mm -hmm. So uh, not only are we protecting our adolescents in that 13 to 15 age group, but we're also protecting all of the folks who may come into contact with those adolescents as well. All right, everyone, we have been live this morning from Veterans Community Project. Yeah. Uh, we are mm. live inside with little Archie, uh, one of the pets that is allowed to be there with the veterans, live there at the tiny house village. They are inside one of those tiny homes. And, and like Colonel Matt Bono said, it's, it's really all you need. And so it's been it's been really thrilling to, to be live with you this morning. Um, Matt, just what would your final message be to folks um, just about as we as we take a moment to pause on this Veterans Day? What do you want everyone to know? Yeah, I think, um, you know, veterans are built for service. You know, we took an oath to protect and defend the Constitution of the United States. And uh, I, I think part of veteran health is staying engaged with something that you're passionate about. And so I would encourage people, you know, find something that you're passionate about. This is something I'm passionate about. Uh, and, and serve those organizations. Uh, you know, it helps other people, helps your fellow vets, and, um, uh, you know, it really makes for, makes for a good life. Hey, Matt, I don't want to make Archie get up, but would he jump up and take us outside so that um, we can just take one quick look at your village? I just think it's so neat and special, and it's such a beautiful day. Can you guys take us outside real quick and just uh, show us around real fast? Yeah, you bet. Come on, buddy. It's an awful tall bed, so I'll put him down. Okay. On, Let's get you Come coming. on, buddy. <laughs> there you go, bud. He's happy to go outside because there's birds. I know. I love it. How many houses out there? So this is. Uh, so we have four, we have 49 tiny houses here. Uh, 45 of them are this size, so they're the 240 square foot houses, and then we have four family size houses, which are 320 square foot. So just a little bit bigger. Uh, they've got a bunk system in, so they can and a queen bed, so they can fit a family of five. Well, it's a beautiful space, a beautiful neighborhood uh, made for those veterans. So we appreciate you showing us around today. Archie, thank you for getting up. We appreciate that. Matt, thank you so much for your service, mm -hmm. uh, most importantly. And uh, please give our best to uh, uh, all of your community members out there today. And we're going to put some information now up on the screen so that if anybody wants to reach out, um, donate uh, to the uh, Veterans Community Project, you can do it right there. You can go to 8825 Troost and drop off um, any needs that uh, the homeless veterans have. Also needs for their animals. If you're an animal lover, Vets with Pets is uh, holding a drive through Monday, but you can drop those off really anytime and they will appreciate it. So thank you both for joining us this morning. Dr. Yadlinski, your final thoughts. 
Yeah, I just want to echo what Colonel Bono said, which is uh, find what you're passionate about, especially when it comes to helping out our veterans, uh, whether that be uh, something like the Veterans Community Project. Uh, I'm involved with an organization called Band of Runners, which brings trail running to our veterans, especially those with PTSD, and to our Gold Star families. Uh, and, and just see what you can do to help out. Barry, your final uh, thoughts today. Well, I'd just say if, if you're a veteran or not a veteran, um, if you are struggling right now during this time, reach out and get help. Mm -hmm. It's not, there's so many resources out there, which we talked about. You just got to go to the right place. And I would even say, I'd say, start with your primary care provider. Mm -hmm. um, they can help direct you. you know, we have, there's counselors, there's um, psychologists, there's all sorts of people out there that can help. Just ask for help and people will be willing and, and help and get the, get you where you need to be. And I like, Carrie, that we, we've kind of advanced the ball forward even a little bit with people kind of pulling that stigma away from yes. getting help and yeah. reaching out. So 100%. Good just, to know. Just ask. Just ask for help. And I, I, one of our viewers, Dr. Yedlinski, says, Happy Veterans Day to you. She is a strong advocate for the health and safety of our children in our community. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay, thank you both for your service, Dr. Hawkinson. Your final yeah, thoughts you know, today. Certainly, thank you to our veterans. You know, thank you for protecting, uh, protecting us, protecting our democracy. My, my grandpas were serving in World War II in the Pacific and in Italy. Um, so, thank all the veterans through time that have helped this great country. Also, continue to get vaccinated, and certainly, Dr. Yedlinski knows and understands this. I just saw a story right now. Um, 22 million infants missed their measles vaccine in 2020. We have gotten these childhood preventable diseases under control because of vaccination. It is so important to get your children to their physician's appointments to get those vaccines to help protect them and protect the people around them as well. And so um, we know that they work, we know that they're safe. Please continue to, to get your children vaccinated, get yourself vaccinated and really protect yourself and the rest of uh, rest of your bubble, really. Thanks for all of our guests today. And thank you all for joining us. And please continue to send in your photos of your kids um, and your grandkids. We love showing how they are leading the way, they're being brave and they're taking their shots. So mm -hmm. please send those in and we will show them right here on our show. And please um, join us on Facebook Messenger and also you can send those in on Medical News Network. We'll show those again at the end of the program. Thanks for being with us coming up tomorrow. It is Follow-Up Friday, as always. So we're going to get to some of those questions that we did not get to earlier in the week. We're also going to hear from one expert who advises schools on kids masking and COVID. We know parents have many questions on what to do now that their kid is vaccinated, but other kids are not. And this all comes while the masking mandates are starting to be lifted in many districts. So we'll talk more about that tomorrow. Have a great Thursday. Happy Veterans Day. We'll see you at 8 a.m. tomorrow. Subscribe to our morning medical update and open mics with Dr. Stites podcasts. Now everywhere podcasts are available.